So the first thing I kind of wanted to talk about a little bit is sort of defining the militia. So when we're talking about the militia here, what exactly do we mean? Because in the early Republic period and in periods before um, when the United States wasn't even a country yet, um, and when territorial militias and state militias and various other things were kind of in a, in a flux, we need to define our terms a little bit more clearly. So most of us probably have something like this in mind when we're thinking about specifically like Minutemen. Um, when we tend to think about militia, we don't often think about them in a positive way, but Minutemen, we do think about it in a positive way. Minutemen have this sort of um, militia tradition from the Revolutionary War, and they have this kind of uh, respect and admiration from uh, American historiography and from even battlefields and commanders during the Revolutionary War. They did a great deal of fighting. And we have a lot of kind of American mythology tied up to the idea of the Minuteman, somebody who's ready at a moment's notice uh, to go fight for their country in a patriotic cause. Um, so obviously we have uh, kind of these heroic um, sort of portraits by guys like Don Trioni. <clears throat> and we also have all sorts of statues like at Lexington and Concord. Um, we have these statues that are, that are put up sort of commemorating the idea of the Minuteman. We don't have these for many other members of the militia uh, at all. It, it tends to be a lot more complicated and we tend to kind of think of militia, uh, especially during the War of 1812 as essentially a broken arm of the American military. Uh, it was a good idea uh, to make uh, your citizens your primary soldiers, but ultimately it didn't work. Uh, and it didn't work because you know they're, they're lazy or they're too incompetently led or they're too divisive or democratic. Um, and there's some truth to some of these, uh, but we're going to kind of break out, break down a few of those uh, as we go through. So the first thing we need to talk a little bit about is what what makes a man a member of the militia. And there are wildly different ideas about this, um, even within the boundaries of the United States, uh, between different states and different territories, they had different requirements for membership, but almost all of them had uh, a citizenship requirement meaning you had to be a citizen of the United States. And a lot of that had to do with the idea of having an interest um, in your local community, whether that was property or some form of community leadership or something like that. Uh, the interest is what kind of made you a citizen. Um, so having an interest, usually the way that we think about this um, and the way that it was codified in a lot of early American laws is owning property. If you own property, you were somebody who was considered uh, worthy of citizenship or just de facto granted citizenship by virtue of having property in that, in that country. So uh, national um, nationalization laws and things change a little bit, uh, but for the most part, uh, if you are a, a property owning uh, male between the ages of about 18 to 45 or sometimes 16 to 45 or sometimes 16 to 60 or sometimes 18 to 60, uh, again, it varies quite a lot. Um, you are required to be a member of the militia. Um, that means that for the most part, you have to own what's called a stand of arms. So stand of arms is basically the military kit of the time. So that meant a musket, a uh, musket capable of mounting a bayonet and a cartridge box at the very least. Um, some different places had uniform requirements, some didn't. Um, William Hull, when he actually got to Michigan in 1805, uh, put some pretty heavy requirements on the territorial militia to uniform themselves very, uh, very early on uh, in his uh, tenure as governor. And you can see that sometimes it didn't work. Sometimes men were just not capable of paying for the, uh, the cost of a uniform as they uh, could sometimes be quite expensive. Um, but again, heavy regional variations. Um, we'll talk a little bit about like the Kentucky volunteers that are sort of one of the few branches of uh, the American militia that are sort of celebrated in the memory of the War of 1812, who were, as sometimes people forget, members of the militia. Um, in any case, uh, there's a big difference uh, when we're talking about kind of the, the men who fought in the war. Uh, it's usually divided into a couple of different categories. So there's regulars, there's volunteers with a capital V, and then there's militia, and then there's volunteers with a, a small V. So the regulars are members of the American military. They are uh, members who enlisted uh, or were officers of what they call the regulars, right? They're uh, paid in the service of the American state. They are uh, mem like properly uniformed, blue-coated, trained members of the army. Uh, they're subject to military discipline and they're subject to the, the American military hierarchy in a way that the militia isn't. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, volunteers with a capital V, are the short-term soldiers that are enlisted at the beginning of a conflict and usually either serve either year-long terms 
three year long terms or for the duration of the war. So they count as regulars. They are regulars, but they're typically uh, sort of talked about a little bit differently because the regulars who had enlisted before the war are a little bit reluctant to kind of grant that sort of status to people who joined up at the beginning of a conflict. Uh, we also have the militia. Again, these are kind of local uh, musters, generally for very short term actions uh, that are, again, members of uh, community service forces, essentially, that are also armed and expected to serve in combat uh, for various things. And then we have the little v volunteers. And this is when things get a little bit confusing, because sometimes, um, even in, in pretty well written works of history, there's some confusion between capital V volunteers and little v volunteers. And one of the ways that uh, the American military establishment operated, especially in the War of 1812, when the, the bulk of its war fighting capability rested on the militia, was by literally asking people to volunteer when they were doing things that were particularly dangerous. So there's a couple of cutting out expeditions uh, when sailors and men in boats went out to capture the British ships. Um, volunteers were asked for before they went to do that. So they didn't just say like you and you and you are coming with me. They maybe had a detachment of 20 or 40 soldiers. And then the commander of that would go in front of the men, make a big speech and, and ask people to come with him. Uh, and this was something that American commanders did throughout the entire duration of the conflict. Uh, and it happened quite, a, quite often in uh, Hull's campaign as well. So that's the kind of the major differences. Uh, again, regulars enlisted usually before uh, the war serving usually pretty long uh, enlistments. Volunteers were short terms uh, that were enlisted uh, for that particular conflict with really no plans and being career men afterward. Then we have militia, which is this sort of freestanding structure uh, that is more complicated than just the military, but also serves a military purpose. And then volunteers, which can be regulars, capital V volunteers or militiamen, depending on what the, uh, the action was at hand. So moving on a little bit. So when William Hull was appointed uh, by President Jefferson in 1805 uh, to be, there's William Hull right there, to be the governor of Michigan, one of the first things that he decided to do was to organize a territorial militia. Michigan was in a complicated place because the a majority of its citizens were Francophone. They spoke French and only French. Um, not many of them actually spoke English. And a lot of the people that moved to Michigan uh, when Hull took over or, or had established businesses um, who did speak English were from New York. And there was kind of an uncomfortable balance between those kind of populations. It, it wasn't too nasty or anything like that, uh, but it, it was definitely sort of a, a class clashing uh, when Hull first arrived. So Hull arrives, he sets up this idea of the, his, his kind of ideal model of the militia, which was this sort of three tiered um, process that like the really young men would essentially become the Minutemen. They'd be the people who trained all the time and were ready at a moment's notice to go out and, and act for the, the defense of the territory. Um, they, he had what he called the Michigan Legion and the Michigan Legion would have had this very kind of resplendent, very peacockish uh, American military uniform. And Hull also made sure to make that available to his men by bulk buying the blue wool that they would have needed to make their uniforms and selling it to them uh, out of the goodness of his heart. So um, he had this, uh, this whole kind of elaborate idea, but the reality was there just weren't as enough men uh, in the territory to kind of fill out that kind of three tiered complicated process. And even if there were so many people were uninterested in military service because they were men like fur traders, they were somewhat transient. They, they lived um, in Detroit for a portion of the year and then were out doing other things for a portion of the year. So being able to kind of serve with any kind of consistency was actually quite difficult. So in order to fill some of the gaps, he actually turned to what we might consider some pretty unusual um, sources. And for one thing, he picked a guy named Peter Dennison, who was a free black man uh, in the Detroit uh, territory or the, in, in the city of Detroit um, to lead a company of what were termed renegados, uh, at least according to an Ohio militiaman who saw them at the beginning of the war. So this was a, a company of about 40 men, all of whom were free black men, um, some of whom were not officially legally free black men. Um, they were still in uh, what was kind of a shortcut slash illegal workaround to the Northwest Ordinance, which forbade slavery in Northwest Territories. Um, as soon as they set foot in the Northwest Territory, they were forced to sign an indenture contract for a term like for 99 years or something like that. So Denison actually had his contract purchased 
um, so that he could be set free to be the, the captain of this company of, of what were termed again, free black renegados. Um, and they're mentioned in some of the legal documents in the history of Detroit. They're also mentioned by several Ohio militiamen who remarked on um, their sort of actions in the beginning of the war. Um, but around 1812, there were roughly 600 men or so in the Michigan militia. Um, they were spread between Detroit and Mackinac. So it wasn't really a force that could be like mustered, lickety split and, and you know, defending Fort Detroit. They were serving, you know, at this point, one of, one of the country's uh, largest coastlines, uh, especially one that bordered the enemy that they were expecting to fight. So this wasn't something that they could really rely on for a lot of short-term uh, actions, which is why at the beginning of the war, um, Hull ended up moving on and relying quite heavily on the Ohio militia to, to come to march up to Detroit uh, and to carry the action across the border. So before the war, um, especially in, uh, I'll kind of very briefly kind of go over the causes of the War of 1812 as a whole, and we'll talk more specifically about kind of what was going on in uh, Michigan and Ohio and what might have been important for the citizens and the militia of, of, uh, of those states and territories. Um, essentially, what, what we have to start the war is tensions with Great Britain. And the tensions with Great Britain revolve around their war with Napoleon. And as a sort of effect of their war against Napoleon, they were cracking down on, on the free trade of the Atlantic. And they were um, capturing sailors, uh, British citizens, um, to serve in the Royal Navy. So that process was called impressment. And one of the ways that they filled their enormous navy, the largest navy in the world at the time, um, they found British citizens that either didn't have proof that they had a job or flat out didn't have a job or were serving on civilian ships like trade ships um, or were serving on American trade ships or Swedish trade ships or Danish trade ships. And what they would do is they'd stop these ships in the high seas, search them, find out any um, British citizens, and they would impress them into the Royal Navy. Uh, this was unpopular even in Britain. Uh, people in Britain didn't like to be pressed into service in the Royal Navy if they could avoid it. Uh, it was especially unpopular in the United States, and there were quite a few political tensions uh, between the two countries as a result of that. Um, the, the trade um, issue was essentially that they were blockading most of, of mainland Europe and preventing uh, Americans from trading freely with the French, who had been a long-term trade partner since the founding of the nation. Um, so both of those issues were really popular in the, the East Coast um, sort of centers, uh, the political centers of the country. Um, out in the Western territories or the Northwestern territories, uh, the, the issues at stake were uh, much more immediate and much more violent uh, and were considered uh, mostly the British kind of sticking their noses in regional politics by stirring up um, native resentment and sort of directing it against the United States. So this is true, this was happening, but it was under the leadership of uh, a guy named Tenskwatawa, or at least his name changed to Tenskwatawa in about 1807. Uh, he was known as Lala Wathika before that. He was a, um, a Shawnee uh, who rose to prominence as what they called the prophet. Uh, and he was a prophet that was sort of preaching for pan-Indian unity and resistance to the United States. Uh, this uh, ended up centering him at uh, building a town called Prophetstown that was actually deliberately across the 1794 Fort Wayne Treaty uh, that they had to end the, the, uh, the Fort Wayne, or not Fort Wayne, sorry, the Northwest Indian War in the 1790s. And uh, Prophetstown was uh, a couple of miles east of that border territory as kind of a thumb in the eye of the Americans who had constantly been treaty jumping uh, and had been going over their um, supposed borders for a long time. So this led to some tensions uh, there was a vast confederacy that was forming, um, not only under Lala Wathika slash Tenskwatawa's leadership, but also his brother Tecumseh, who is arguably at this point a, a lot more famous. Um, and between the two of them, with sort of the, the marriage of the, of the political or the political and religious preaching um, with the canniness and warfighting ability of Tecumseh, it became a formidable and very terrifying uh, prospect to a lot of uh, Americans in the, the Northwest, Northwest territories here. Um, so the, uh, the governor of Indiana um, was sort of famously opposed to all this, and he led uh, an inter intervention in 1811 uh, that was called the Battle of Tippecanoe. Um, so William Henry Harrison led a force of a small number of regulars and uh, many more militia to attack Prophetstown. Um, and it was kind of a mess of a battle. It was uh, a bit chaotic, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of that a little bit later. But you should know that this happened before the War of 1812 was declared, and Harrison, 
um, went off to basically claim that he had ended this uh, this Indian Confederacy once and for all, and it was nothing you had to worry about anymore. Um, and he erased the British presence uh, from the Northwest, and so don't worry about it. And then about eight months later or so, the War of 1812 started. So um, he didn't really do a very good job at ending that. And this was a, a sort of persistent problem that they had um, going on in the war. So the declaration of war as a sort of a result of these sort of three things um, rolled around in June of 1812. And the war plan that the United States had centered essentially on having, using their vast force disparity to overwhelm the borders of Canada. So on paper in, in the United States, they had about 10,000 regulars uh, enrolled in the army. They had quite a few, a lot fewer than that actually enlisted, but they had at least a paper strength, uh, a legal size of the army at the beginning of the war of 10,000 men. This was quickly raised. Um, they ended up getting up to something like 45,000 regulars in the entire army, including the short-term volunteers. Um, but at the beginning of the war, they had 10,000 men and they had 300,000 militia scattered across the country. And the idea was to kind of uh, hastily assemble and muster these men and invade uh, Canada from three different places. And so that included Detroit, that included the Niagara region, and that included uh, going up what they call the Lake Champlain corridor toward Montreal. The idea behind all of this was that all three of these invasions would be simultaneous, that the number of men that they had uh, would utterly dwarf the Canadian defenders. And uh, somewhat infamously, Thomas Jefferson said, uh, as kind of a result of this plan, that the conquest of Canada would be a mere matter of marching. And now the reason they wanted to capture Canada was because obviously it was a British, um, it was still a British colony at the time and American politicians weren't super clear on what exactly they were planning on doing with it after they captured it. They figured we'll capture it and then we'll figure out what to do with it afterward. So there were some in Congress that said basically, well, once we capture it, we're going to bargain it back to Great Britain in, in terms of ending uh, these uh, grievances that they had with the country. Some of them figured, well, the, well of course, we're not going to hand it back. We're going to annex it. Who wouldn't want to be an American? Um, and there were quite a lot of other people who, who more or less uh, were a little bit more hawkish than even the war hawks, which is where the term comes from, um, about what they were planning on doing with Canada. So uh, this was the idea, right? On paper, it makes a lot of sense. You have so many more men. You have a, a vast... Uh, border that you can overwhelm. And in Canada, as far as they knew, they only had about 3,000 uh, generally sort of old left behind men that weren't considered good soldiers enough to go over and fight Napoleon. And they had a much, much, much smaller territorial militia spread out you know, over a much larger area. So on paper, this is an idea that works. The problem is that for one thing, it relied almost entirely on the willingness of the militia to engage. And there are quite a lot of legal issues that were discussed in Congress is, you know, near to the declaration of war is a couple of months. So essentially, there were some in Congress who were saying that it was illegal to use the militia to do any kind of cross border attacks, because according to the, the Constitution, uh, the militia had a, a limit on serving the term was overseas. So the argument was, well, does Canada count as overseas? Because technically, yes, we mean maybe over in Europe, but it also could be shorthand for literally crossing a border, right? So legally, this wasn't really settled in 1812. Um, and you can tell by the behavior of some of the, uh, the officers, again, asking for those volunteers with a little V whenever they're going over a border shows that they understood that the militia might be recalcitrant when it comes to crossing a border, because the idea of the militia is to defend the country, not to attack another one. Uh, and this kind of this problem is made explicitly clear in one event in the Niagara region that we might have a little bit of time to talk about, but we'll see. So part of the problem is, right, you have to kind of rely on the willingness of the militia to fight the war. And this is something that is absolutely by design, in my opinion. Uh, this is something that in a republic, which is what the United States was, um, you only should do as well in a war as the people in the country want you to do, right? So if you don't have support for the war, then obviously they're not going to show up to fight. And if they don't show up to fight, well, then maybe you should have thought a little harder about the war before declaring it and trying to invade a foreign country. Um, but it, early on in the war, there was actually quite a lot of enthusiasm from the militia. Um, most of the people that actually showed up um, seemed to be, at the very least, very interested in attacking Canada. And this kind of idea was actually lauded by William Hull, 
um, when he first started marching up from Ohio uh, toward Detroit, uh, as we'll see in a little bit. So Hull was actually in New York uh, when the war was declared, and he was essentially, he first attempted to um, resign as governor of Michigan. He thought he should give that, that uh, role to somebody else who was more experienced and younger and fitter and more or less better able to lead. Uh, but he ultimately decided to, um, in a very sort of citizen way, um, I guess you could put it, he thought that it was his duty to protect the, the people of the territory of Michigan and the Northwest. And he decided that it was, you know, his job to do so. And so he, he stepped up, made a march with a uh, supply train uh, all the way to Ohio, and then from Ohio began marching all the way up to Detroit. So this map up here that I just put up is actually from the William or the Robert Lucas Journal. Robert Lucas, of course, if you're all from Ohio, you should probably recognize the name. Uh, eventually became governor after the war, uh, and he kept a journal, a day-to-day -day journal of his activities as an enlisted volunteer militiaman, a volunteer scout. Um, so this actually shows uh, the route that he took. The red is the route that he took as a scout, and the green is the march from Hull, um, from Ohio, all the way up to Detroit. So one of the things that Hull actually notes when he first starts uh, marching off in his sort of daily correspondence with the War Department was that uh, a lot of the Ohio militiamen actually had in their little caps, little tabs that said conquer or die. Uh, and quite a lot of them were very eager to go to Detroit and to marshal everything up and to invade Canada. They thought this was a great idea and it was going to be a really fun time. Um, but we also have some kind of conflicting reports. So early on in the march, um, there was a problem with pay. Uh, Hull wasn't actually able to pay men when they were supposed to be paid. And some of this included um, giving free, or not free, but giving uniforms and shoes to men who actually had mustered for the militia service. And when that wasn't forthcoming, six men decided to go home. They said, well, you didn't fulfill your end of the bargain. We're heading out of here. Um, and Hull actually describes in one of his uh, daily reports to the War Department that these six men were mocked. Uh, publicly mocked by the rest of the militia who actually played the rogues march and followed behind them with a drum as they were leaving camp in a way that's usually reserved for mutineers or people who are being literally drummed out of the service. Uh, and this was something that they thought was such a stain on the honor and patriotism of the United States that these six men in particular should be singled out for this kind of um, sort of public censure. Um, but later on, and this is a, a story that doesn't actually appear in, in Hull's daily correspondence. Um, Hull tells a story um, in 1816, which is pretty important for reasons we'll get into in a moment, um, that he saw, he heard some commotion at the edge of camp. And when an officer went to go check out what was happening with the Ohio militia, it turns out they were just riding one of their officers out of camp on a rail. Uh, and this was also, again, kind of a, a sort of public censure, a way to uh, humiliate men who weren't behaving properly. And Hull was using this as a defense in his court martial in 1816, when he was actually court martialed for cowardice and treason. Um, and in order to sort of vindicate his good name, he wrote a he he wrote a biography essentially of his uh, performance in the the Northwest War, is what he called it, or the Northwest Campaign. Um, and then suddenly you see this big disparity between what's actually happening um, in his daily reports. He's certainly not reporting that any of his men rode off their officers in a rail um, when he's sending this back to the War Department. But later on, a few years after, uh, a few years after his kind of humiliation and defeat, suddenly now he's got all these problems with the, with the uh, Ohio militia. And we see this kind of over and over and over again. Uh, if you're looking at Hull's tract that he wrote after the war, it's, it's a, a, a series of problems after problems after problems of um, you know, men being not listening to their officers and, sorry, my headphone wire came out one moment. Uh, but men not listening to their officers, men being mutinous, men being disagreeable, uh, refusing to obey orders, and again, riding their officers out on a rail. Uh, but again, we don't see this in his daily reports, uh, the ones that are closer to the action. And by the time he gets to Detroit, the letter that he sends actually praises the Ohio militiamen uh, because part of their, their route actually goes through what's called the Black Swamp, this kind of big blocky area here. Um, and to get to Detroit from Ohio, they actually had to cut themselves a road. So every single day on top of marching 10 or 20 miles, they had to break out axes and cut down trees and build a log road 
in order to get their supply wagons all the way up to Detroit. Um, and this actually became uh, somewhat of a strategic weakness um, because as William Holt pointed out repeatedly in his correspondence to the War Department, the fact that they didn't control the lakes was a major strategic weakness of this entire campaign. Um, without the ability to actually ferry supplies over the lakes, which is how most things got to Detroit, uh, it was very, very, very difficult to keep the force supplied. And this, this becomes a huge strategic weakness uh, in this early part of the campaign. So uh, when he finally gets to Detroit, um, what he wants to do is, is uh, essentially consolidate what they have, uh, defend the, the territory, and um, be the third prong of this three-pronged invasion of Canada. So what he wants to do is to invade Canada and to move down uh, into Sandwich, which is uh, what we call Windsor today, um, and move down to the fort at Am Amherstburg, which was called Fort Malden at the time. But the difficulty is you can't really plan or succeed in an invasion if you don't have a regular supply route. And you can't have the regular supply route that Paul wanted without control of the lakes. So reading again his daily correspondence over and over and over again, he's begging Congress to do something to send more boats onto the lakes, to give him uh, permission to build gunboats so that he can use it to protect uh, river crossings or kind of interdict uh, British interference with the supplies because the one road coming from Ohio through the Black Swamp and up uh, to, uh, to Detroit actually came closer to Amherstburg uh, at parts of its journey than it was to Detroit or any other American stronghold. So this becomes a major problem. And although Hull, Hull invades Detroit in early, uh, Hull invades Canada, I'm sorry, uh, in early July and sort of sits there for a couple of weeks, um, he can't do anything because he doesn't have the supplies that he needs in order to get men out and marching. Um, most of these men don't have tents. Um, we find out that when he sends a couple of uh, relief columns to go um, allow one of these supply uh, trains to get up, uh, it starts raining. And many of the men are actually forced to kind of take shelter under split rails of fences that line the road. So they have no tents, they don't have coats, they don't have winter clothing, they don't have anything that can really help them in any adverse weather. And they're expected not only to keep the one road of their supply lines open, but also invade Canada and attack fortified locations and fight British redcoats and their native allies at the same time. It was something that was very, very, very difficult. So when Hull arrived in Detroit, um, he again was trying to sort of uh, get these supplies ready to go. And a lot of this was ammunition and food, uh, medicine and, you know, tents and clothing and things like that. And this was actually coming up from Ohio under the command of a guy named uh, Henry Brush. So Henry Brush, uh, you can see in the map here, was uh, coming up from the south and camped at the River Raisin in early August. Uh, he decided that with his small force, it was about 250 men uh, guarding these supply wagons. It was too risky to take the one road past Amherstburg um, with its, you know, British redcoats and their native allies who were on canoes who could go back and forth across the river very easily. Um, and he figured it would be too severe a loss if he tried to risk that without a proper escort. So he sent a couple of scouts forward. One of them was actually Robert Lucas himself, who came up and asked Hull to send a relief force to help bring Brush and the rest of the column back up. So in early August, they actually sent a guy named Van Horn. Uh, Van Horn comes all the way down to Brownstown, which is along the river here. Um, and they get uh, ambushed by British and, and Indian forces, and they're routed really badly. So they lose 17 men killed, um, uh, about twice as many wounded, and they make a hasty retreat back to Detroit. Uh, and that happened on August 8th. So two days later, Hull organizes a second uh, relief attempt, and this actually includes 600 men, 200 regulars from the uh, 4th uh, Infantry the 4th Infantry Regiment, uh, those were the only regulars that went along on this attack, as well as some elements of the uh, artillery that was at Detroit, which included uh, several regular officers who were actually like West Point trained proper artillery officers. Um, so they had a six pound cannon and a howitzer that they took down with them, uh, along with these 600 men. So 400 of those men were members of the militia. This was about half Ohio militia and half Detroit militia. Um, they head down. Uh, and they're attacked in almost the same place. There's actually a description from uh, one of the Ohio militia that accompanied this column that said they were in basically the footsteps of the ambush from the, uh, a couple of days before. 
uh, when they were attacked again. And this was, uh, whereas Van Horn's uh, first attempt was more of a skirmish, a very small skirmish, this was a proper battle. Um, and the descriptions from some of the officers who were involved and uh, some of the militiamen, this includes two different militiamen who wrote um, post-war journals, uh, and one of them from, uh, one of them was a young French Canadian man who fought on the Canadian side, give these very, uh, very interesting sort of uh, counter narratives about what was actually happening. The Canadian guy uh, was a pretty young, uh, pretty young man, and he actually wrote that he thought there were as many as 2,000 Americans opposing them, or 2,500 Americans who were opposing their very, very small force of Canadians, of 200 Canadian men and British regulars and Native allies. And would we, we know pretty confidently that it was 600 Americans, uh, and the British force was about 200 or so. Um, it was sometimes kind of hard to count the Native war parties because they kind of were transient and came and went. Um, in any case, the Battle of Brownstown on uh, August 10th uh, lasted several hours. Um, they had uh, quite a few sort of set piece engagements and it ended with a bayonet charge of the American militia leading a bayonet charge over um, barriers that the British had thrown across the road. Um, one, uh, one Detroit man, uh, a captain named Captain DeCant was actually singled out for bravery for being the first man with his bayonet fixed over the barriers to attack the British Grenadiers. Um, and the Americans actually ended up winning this battle under Miller, under Colonel Miller here. Um, Colonel Miller, on the other hand, uh, decided that he had taken too many casualties and again turned around and headed back to Detroit. So despite the fact that he won this battle and despite the fact that they had for the, at least this moment opened up the supply line, he turned around and actually didn't even send word down to Brush that the battle had been won and the way was cleared. So Brush sat there for another couple of days, unsure of what to do because he had received no word and eventually decided to take his force to essentially looping around west and northward to get at Detroit from the, uh, from the west side to avoid kind of going up uh, near the Detroit River where he'd be vulnerable to these British war parties. So a lot of this was more or less because uh, you had to rely on this, this single road. You had to rely on kind of constantly clearing against these raids because they didn't control the lake. And this was something that Hull was very cognizant of, uh, as I've mentioned a couple of times already, to make sure that this was a priority for the American War Department in order to have any successful invasion of Canada. So uh, it should also be pointed out that Hull, despite the fact that he's generally looked at as kind of an incompetent leader, was the only one of this three-pronged invasion that actually started at the time it was supposed to. So early August was supposed to be the time that all three of these invasions sort of coincided. We were supposed to have an invasion across the Detroit River, an invasion across the Niagara River, an invasion again up that Lake Champlain corridor all around the same time to again overwhelm and outstretch the British forces in Canada. Uh, as it happened, because Hull was the only one who had invaded, because Hull was the only one who actually kind of showed any sort of um, it, exuberance or inertia in, in going over this, he was the one that was kind of singled out and attacked in a British counterattack. So a couple of other things to point out is that um, in the initial invasion of Canada, which was not met with any resistance, it was basically just loading up boats and going over the Detroit River to Sandwich. Um, there was at least one company of um, Ohio militia who refused to cross the border. Uh, this is mentioned uh, both by Hull and by Robert Lucas, but neither of them actually give the number of men that did this. Uh, and the, the estimate ranges from, I think, um, uh, well, they both give sort of numbers, but they conflict pretty heavily. So Hull gives a small number of saying it's about one company or so, maybe 40, 50 men. And Lucas says it's something like 200 men refused to go across. Uh, either way, it doesn't stop the invasion. It doesn't really inconvenience anybody. And those forces are the same people that are drawn in uh, this attempt by Miller to go open the um, the supply line. So clearly they were motivated to fight, but maybe reluctant to you know invade Canada for various reasons. Um, and that is something that again, kind of post-war gets kind of inflated to, uh, to the point where it overshadows the performance of the militia in these two skirmishes, um, which were uniformly praised um, by even Van Horn, who kind of beat feet back to Detroit in not disgrace necessarily, but certainly without the success that Miller had. Um, and uh, it should be pointed out that Miller was a regular officer. He was an officer of the 4th uh, Infantry Regiment of the American Army, and his decision to turn around and leave Brush essentially hanging in the breeze um, was a decision made by, again, the regular officer. So this is going to kind of lead us to doing a little bit of myth busting um, about what exactly 
it means to be militia, what exactly it means to be regular, and how that's talked about, um, especially by historians, uh, modern historians now. So the military in the 18th century was pretty patchwork, right? We kind of look at the military now, we look at the army now as something that's like very professional, very well uh, organized to an extent. Uh, at least, it, you know, it has this very coherent training. They didn't really have that in the 18th century. Uh, they had what they called the manual exercise, which is pictured in a much earlier manu uh, manual here. Manual exercise was essentially the way to, to drill with your musket to know that you could load and fire it uh, very rapidly. So the idea was to get it down to a point where you could do it in 20 seconds on average, um, which is, it takes some skill. It takes a lot of practice. And this was something that regulars in the army had quite a lot of training with. But the fact was that training isn't really something that was really highly thought of in the 18th century or the long 18th century, which includes basically up until about 1815. Um, the idea was that combat experience is what makes good soldiers, not training. Um, especially in the American army and the British army, who tended to be very small uh, when they weren't actually at war. The opportunities that you have to actually do mass training between um, men who are at you know, three or four or five brigades all working together at once was extremely rare. So what we get is this sort of constant axiom that modern historians kind of throw against the militia is like, oh, well, the reason they're not, they don't perform well in combat is that they're not trained like the regulars are. But then they don't actually realize that the training of a regular wasn't that great either. Um, sometimes you had marksmanship training, sometimes you did long distance marching, but it was all within a company or two of size. So maybe a hundred men, maybe a couple hundred men working together. But once you actually throw those two companies together, into a brigade or a battalion, they have just as much experience as the militia in large scale combat, which is to say none. Um, and at least in the, the old Northwest, this was essentially an active war zone from the 1790s, from the 1780s uh, after the American revolution. Um, this was something that was constantly exposing men on the frontier to combat action. So contrary to the kind of the, the historical axiom that's thrown around, the militia were the ones with the combat experience at the beginning of the war. They were the ones that actually, um, for the most part, and sort of as, as a whole, um, had more experience than, than many of the men in uh, the regular army. So this is somewhat complicated too by the fact that the 4th Infantry uh, Regiment had actually been some of the regulars that were sent to Tippecanoe. So some of them, some of their officers certainly had combat experience, but not all of them. Um, and this kind of sort of complicates the picture, right? Because I guarantee you, any of you can go up now and pick up a book that mentions militia combat in maybe the early 19th century, and you will find a sentence somewhere, I promise you, because I've read like all of them, you'll find a sentence somewhere that basically says something about militia being poorly trained as compared to regulars who, they never really come out and say it, but we're expected to believe have been extremely, exceptionally highly trained. And that's just not the case. That's just not the way that, that um, the military worked in the early 19th century. Um, another problem that, that the militia sort of is brought up constantly is the idea that they have elected leadership. Uh, and the idea was that somebody was popular. So that popular person was elected to be an officer rather than somebody who had a lot of experience, rather than somebody who was uh, a good combat leader or what have you. Um, and this is, you know, tricky. Sometimes it's true and sometimes it isn't. Uh, there are quite a, quite a lot of militia officers who actually served with distinction during the war. Uh, Colonel Solomon Ben Rensselaer, uh, who was actually the uh, sort of de facto leader at the initial push up the cliff at the, the Battle of um, uh, Queenston Heights, was shot like a comical number of times in that first charge. And he was actually a militia officer serving under his cousin, who was also a militia officer, who was the general in charge of that entire operation. Uh, this included working with other regular officers. And the other half of my thesis was about Niagara, but I don't want to bog everything down with that quite, quite yet. Um, but the biggest difference that I would contend between regulars and militia is that the militia are not necessarily subject to the military discipline hierarchy the way that regulars are. So the thing is, right, if I'm a regular officer, if I'm a colonel or a general in charge of, of this invasion of Canada, I have to make sure to dot my I's and cross my T's to make sure that if I'm going to invade Canada and I'm going to call for volunteers, 
that I don't do something that makes all of those volunteers just say, nah, never mind. Right. I have to lead them because if I don't lead them, I cannot force them to go because they have sort of more or less a collective bargaining against me because they actually hold all of the combat force that I have. I can't possibly invade Canada with my two or 300 regulars. I need the support of the militia. The militia know that. They know that this is kind of a legal question. And so they can essentially get away with um, disobeying officers or uh, arguing about orders or doing things that from a military standpoint, from purely military standpoint, look treasonous or inefficient, but from a like a democracy standpoint or a Republican standpoint, make a whole lot of sense, right? We can kind of see these guys as, as being pretty shrewd, like union guys, making sure that the army pays them and like gives them the tents that they need and make sure that they're fed and have access to medicine. Um, and when those aren't furnished, that's what creates the problems that what's what creates men who are unwilling to do things like invade a foreign country when that's a legal question. They can kind of take advantage of these sort of legal ambiguities. And that's what makes the militia so dangerous from the perspective of the military hierarchy, because you can't run a war if your men can disobey you. Whereas if they're all in the, the military hierarchy, you can, you know, give them corporal punishment. Technically, this was illegal in the American army by 1812, but that didn't stop them. Uh, we have numerous accounts of men being being whipped, not necessarily flogged, but forced to run the gauntlet, being beaten with, with rods or being tied to rails, uh, which was a, a particularly humiliating and painful process um, for sort of comical and public punishment. And I, I personally think that that is the distinction. And that's one of the reasons why the, the historiography that we have written by men who were uh, ambitious politicians or ambitious people within the military, they don't want to deal with an army that can disobey their orders and get away with it. Certainly not. And if we look at it from that perspective, things start to make a little bit more sense. Things start becoming a little bit more complicated because we can't see the militia as just this bunch of people who aren't motivated to do anything. We have to see them as something that are they're intelligent men operating within the legal framework as they understand it, looking for not necessarily advantages to themselves, but reasons to do things that are that are more than just like the prospect of punishment. And you do not have that option if you're a regular. If you're in the militia, you do, because you have access to a sort of parallel hierarchy. Um, and that's what makes it so, so sort of inefficient from a military standpoint. And that's the thing that I think is missing from a lot of historiography about the militia is that they everybody's sort of writing it from this perspective. Of, oh, if the militia just had obeyed orders, we would have captured Canada. And then you don't really stop to think about like, okay, well, why do you want them to con conquer Canada? That doesn't like, we're supposed to just like research this and ask questions about it, not root for our team, right? <laughs> um, so I could go on about this for a long time, but I, I will move on uh, for the next time. Oh, I've gone backward. So, oh no, never mind. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the invasion already, uh, it's sort of weirdly broken up, but this is a plan of Fort Detroit, uh, as you can see. And the problem with uh, coordinating all of this was quite simply the fact that you don't have the supplies that you need uh, to sustain an invasion. Um, various militia refusals we've already talked about a little bit, but the invasion continued more or less until William Hull found out in early August that Fort Mackinac had been captured. So Fort Mackinac was captured in July of 1812, uh, and their commander, Porter Hanks, who's here in this call right now, I've seen his name down there in the chat, uh, came down and basically reported to Hull saying that Fort Mackinac had been captured by this swarm of Native Americans and Hull essentially panicked. He withdrew all of his forces from Canada, moved back to Detroit and tried to hole up waiting for this um, uh, reinforcements from Brush. And then he finds out only you know hours after he gets back to Detroit that Miller had gone down, won the battle and then turned around without connecting with Brush. So the situation was looking rather hopeless. And by the time Isaac Brock and his native allies, including Tecumseh, um, got outside Detroit, started crossing the border and bombarding the fort, uh, the situation looked pretty hopeless. So the British forces were actually outnumbered. They were um, not significantly outnumbered, but it was uh, nothing to shake a stick at, I guess. Uh, the American forces were around 2,500 on paper, but some of those men were sick, some of them were wounded, some of them were uh, not mustered uh, properly at the time. And so the number is a little harder to tell. Um, 
a sustained artillery barrage that lasted about two days, um, did some minor damage to the, to the fort, but actually killed a few people, including Porter Hanks, unfortunately, who is still waiting for his court martial to be convened um, as to why he surrendered Fort Mackinac. And he was actually directly struck with a cannonball. So there are some stories about Hull witnessing this. Um, Hull, when he returned from New York to Ohio and then came up to Detroit, had actually brought his family with him. Uh, including his daughters and his wife. And so there are some stories that maybe Hull saw Porter Hanks get struck with a cannonball and maybe thought that one of that that person was one of his daughters. Um, and there are somewhat dubious stories about Hull's state of mind um, when he decided to surrender the fort essentially to Isaac Brock and Tecumseh. Uh, whatever the case, he did. Uh, he surrendered it. Um, he had been essentially outmaneuvered and um, sort of the failures of this sort of single line of uh, the single lifeline of supplies from Ohio up to Detroit kind of sealed his fate. Um, but again, if we kind of take a step back and look at the strate strategic situation, it, I hesitate to say anybody could have done, you know, as well or worse uh, than Hull was given the situation that he was in. Um, again, this was supposed to be a coordinated attack from three different armies from three different places around the border, which would not have given Brock and his native allies time to kind of organize and concentrate against Hull. Uh, if that had happened, if he had had the supplies that he needed or control of the lakes, it would have been a very different story with uh, in terms of supplying his men and giving them food and clothing and shelter and being able to sustain an attack uh, down to a fortified place like Amherstburg or Fort Malden. And without all of these things, I mean, this was essentially doomed. This was a failure not of Hull and not of the militia, but it was a failure of American logistics and strategy because they just simply could not coordinate an attack of this ambition with the military structure that they had at the time. Uh, and again, so I would say that I don't think you could have put Napoleon in this situation. And I don't think he would have done uh, even as well as Hull did. Um, I think he did as well as he could given a really, really cruddy situation. So the aftermath of, uh, of the attack is that 2,500 men or so um, are captured or paroled. So most of the militia were actually paroled. That meant they are technically, they're like kind of like put in the British hierarchy as like a trading card for a prisoner. Um, and they're paroled, but they get to go home and they can't take up arms against Britain until they're exchanged. Um, so this is sort of a fiction, but it also means that you as the person who captured 2,500 people now don't have to feed or shelter them. Uh, which was an expectation uh, according to the rules of war at the time. So one of the tricks that uh, Isaac Brock decided to play on the Americans to help demoralize them was that he took all of these men from the British column or from the American column that he just captured and forced them to march in sight of the forts along the Niagara River. And this was actually a really affecting sight. Uh, there's a guy named John Lovett who was a civilian who was uh, sort of kind of watching and supervising and helping out on the Niagara frontier wrote a a very sort of emotional description of the scene um, when the uh, the Americans kind of uh, walked by as if they've been led like cattle to the slaughter. And it was, it's pretty affecting. And it, it, it's clear that this was actually a pretty effective trick that Brock pulled uh, against them. So uh, Brush and the rest of the Ohio militia that were kind of involved in this sort of helter skelter attempt to bring this uh, relief column back, just turned around and went back to Ohio because the fort had fallen and now it was in the hands of the British and they're not gonna go try to assault uh, Fort Detroit with a couple of hundred men. Uh, and like, what are they gonna do? Throw the food at them? It's not gonna work. So they went back to Ohio um, and there was actually a second attempt uh, at the end of 1812 to retake Detroit. And that ends with the story we probably all at least are vaguely familiar with uh, with the Battle of Frenchtown and the massacre of the River Raisin. Um, so generally bad news all around for pretty much everywhere along the, the Canadian frontier, at least in the year of 1812. Um, this was supposed to be a very quick, uh, very efficient march across the border. And again, Thomas Jefferson proven extremely wrong. The idea that all you had to do was march into Canada and they'd all throw up their hands or run out into the streets and welcome the Americans as uh, liberators. It just wasn't going to happen. Uh, this is uh, one of the many political cartoons that came out uh, around the massacre at the River Raisin. And it's kind of low res to try to find a better version of it, but I couldn't. So the conclusions, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned, is essentially that we shouldn't really be so quick to condemn the militia as uh, a portion of sort of the American military arm at the time. Um, 
we also shouldn't see them as strictly a military arm. They, the militia was a, a much more sort of um, entrenched cultural institution than it was purely something for the military. Uh, but even in their military actions, um, you know, we have reports from these uh, these quick skirmishes and battles uh, for Brush's column that the militia actually performed quite well. Um, over in the Niagara region, one of the reasons that uh, that General Van Rensselaer decided to actually invade uh, on the night that he did was because a lot of his militia actually threatened to go home if he didn't. Um, so the idea that they were this recalcitrant sort of political frenzy uh, men who wanted to see the war brought, you know, brought to an end uh, inconclusively is just flat out wrong. Um, when they actually served, and they served in literally every battle of this entire war, usually in higher numbers than the regulars, they tended to do pretty well. They do really badly when the conditions, such as their food supplies and their shoes and whether or not they have tents and whether or not they have bullets, uh, preclude anyone from doing well in that situation. So on the balance, I would say that militia actually do their job according to the Constitution and the legal expectations that they had. Uh, they serve quite well. Um, militia performance in the whole campaign especially is laudable. Um, there's almost nothing but praise that comes from Hull um, on the days. The thing that he that that kind of gives him a black eye is is his sort of book that he wrote to apologize for his treason, uh, which was technically legally treason. Uh, he was actually found guilty of treason and cowardice. Um, and his uh, sentence was commuted by President Madison for prior service in the Revolutionary War. Um, but Afterward, he writes basically a book where he says, well, it wasn't my fault. It was the militia's fault. Uh, and this is a trend that's picked up by uh, quite a lot of people uh, in the post-war thing, sort of trying to vindicate their service and at the same time explain away the loss of, of the war. And so if you're thinking about this in terms of 1820s and 1830s politics, it would be politically difficult, I would say, uh, to come out and basically say that, yeah, it was a half-baked war that shouldn't have worked anyway, and we probably should have deserved to lose it, because the the American kind of political institution at the time was still very much kind of in the Madison and Jefferson mold. So if you said that, if you said Madison made a mistake by declaring this war and going off half-cocked, then you're basically saying the same thing about pretty much every president ever since, right? And so finding a neutral scapegoat, something that you can basically say, like, that's the reason we lost, it doesn't have anything to do with politics or logistics or strategic failures. It's just the pesky militia. If they had only been a little bit more patriotic, we probably could have won. And this is something that's repeated even by people who are in the militia. Um, so one of my sort of favorite uh, kind of spats involves uh, two militiamen and a regular officer who all blame each other for various failures uh, around the Battle of Queenston Heights. Uh, so this is Winfield Scott, who was a regular. It's Solomon Van Rensselaer, who was a colonel in the militia. Uh, and he's the guy that got shot like six times uh, in the Battle of Queenston Heights. Uh, and there's John Armstrong Jr., who had been in the militia and was the, um, uh, the Secretary of War at the beginning of the war. Uh, and all three of them write different versions of events at Niagara specifically, and all three of them blame each other for what happened. Uh, and all of them conveniently also say, oh, it was all, also the militia. Yeah, don't forget them. Um, and when we kind of look at this in the context of what they were doing, right, they're writing sort of these, uh, I call them ego documents, uh, in order to advance their own political careers, we should really be taking a lot of what they're saying with a grain of salt and comparing them to the reports that we have of the day's actions that we have, sometimes written by the same men. Um, and they're very, very, very different. Uh, and it's not quite as clear uh, as the historiography tends to bear it out. Um, and so unfortunately, most of the historiography hasn't really delved too deeply into this. They haven't really done the work of sort of looking sp suspiciously at these ego documents that are written well after the war, sometimes decades after the war, um, and sort of subjecting them to scrutiny the way I think they ought to have been. Um, some of that is happening a little bit now. So like Anthony Yannick, who wrote um, about the, the fall and recapture of Detroit in the War of 1812, um, does a pretty good job, I think, of sort of getting into Hull's head, but he also falls for the trap of blaming the militia the way that Hull did only in his court martial testimony and only in basically the autobiography that he wrote after the war. Um, so unfortunately, I think that there's a long way to go in terms of the sort of historiography of the war, especially as it pertains to the militia. Um, and that's sort of my rambly conclusion, but uh, I do have time for questions. And uh, remember to donate to Fort Meggs, especially if you enjoyed this um, and if you want to have 
have me back or whatever, go ahead and send, <laughs> send Kelly some, some notes and uh, go check out the Fort Meg site and everything. Uh, but yeah, we've got, I know we have some questions here in the thing. Yeah, so there's about seven questions in the chat, Adam. If you wanted to clear those up first, then we could sure. take any new questions. See if I can. Can't seem to open it up. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, actually. So the first question we have is from Dan Wilkins, where some of these men formerly enslaved by Matthew Elliott at Malden. They absolutely were. Um, some of, there were some, uh, he's talking about the, the renegado militia uh, under Peter Dennison at the beginning of the war. So um, there's actually a really long and very, very interesting story that's written by Tia Miles in her book, um, the, uh, the Dawn of Detroit uh, is the name of the book. So Tia or Tia Miles uh, is the author. And she actually has an entire chapter on Denison and the, the black militia. Um, and one of the reasons, one of, one of the sort of weird things that happens in the War of 1812, one of the many, many weird things that happens as a result is that uh, the Canadians who are, we tend to kind of look at, at being sort of the more, I guess, progressive in a certain way uh, of the two sides in this war. I mean, the, the British and the Canadians are like freeing slaves in the Chesapeake to go like more effectively raid against uh, American plantations and like building regiments of uh, freed slaves are also like sending letters to William Hull before the war saying, hey, return my slaves. Like we could see them across the river drilling around. That's not OK. Give them back. Um, and there are some reports of, of, of Denison like getting into a canoe with a bunch of guys and going over the Detroit river and springing a bunch of slaves and bringing them back across and saying, you're free now. Would you like to join the militia? And of course, like a bunch of them say, well, yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and yeah, it's, it's a, it's a very odd story that, that doesn't uh, get nearly as much press as I think it deserves. I think it's fascinating. Uh, another one from Dan Wilkins. Is it known whether Hull asked the Madison administration for certain conditions, such as serviceable artillery train or local naval superiority before accepting his orders? So he didn't make them conditional, um, but he did essentially when he agreed to go back, he said, like, what I'm going to need, what I'd like to have is, is all of this. Right. And almost all of that stuff is included. So he wanted good artillery. He wanted ammunition for the most part, uh, and he wanted control of the lakes. Uh, and if, again, if you kind of read his daily correspondence, he's constantly harping on anything that would help give him sort of an advantage or, or sort of a safe supply route over the lakes, because he noticed, as did every other commander in the theater, that control of the lake, uh, control of the lakes, especially Lake Erie, was absolutely, absolutely necessary uh, to kind of sustain any sort of offensive attack against Canada. Um, he did know, uh, the last part of the question was, in other words, did he know he was expected to capture American territory? He absolutely did. Um, the, the war plan was, it, like they talked about the war plan even in, in Canadian newspapers. Everyone knew that an invasion was coming and everyone knew that, uh, that it was expected that Americans were going to cross the border. So Robert Ryan asked, uh, were there any individual soldiers involved from Maryland and Delaware in the whole campaign? Not as far as I know. Um, some of the regulars may have been. Uh, the regulars were pulled from all across the country. Uh, and the 4th Regiment actually was um, in sort of a weird place because there were men in the 4th Regiment who were posted as far south as New Orleans. And some of them were posted as far north as Ohio and militia, or Ohio and Michigan, sorry. And uh, so some of those regulars may have been um, from, from uh, Maryland and Delaware, but I, I can't confirm that necessarily. But uh, thanks for the question. Um, so Michel asks, what were the discipline regulations of the militia? Um, so that actually varied quite a lot. Um, so you mentioned uh, Steuben's Blue Book. That was actually a popular one. Um, Smith, uh, Alexander Smith had actually written uh, a tract um, a couple years before the war started. And this was sort of a a subgenre of a lot of American writing at the time. There were like a bunch of militia officers and commanders who thought that they would make their mark by writing books about fencing or about training or about marksmanship or about horseback riding or militia drill ordinances. So um, I don't know necessarily what the Michigan militia specifically were using, but it stands, it's probably a pretty good guess that they might have been using excuse me, Steuben's Blue Book still. That was actually still a very popular and reprinted uh, 
drill manuscript up until I think about the 19th or the 1830s. Uh, Jeff asks, how effectively did militia officers cooperate with regular army officers and was there friction? Again, it depends, <laughs> right? Um, so one of the more, uh, I guess, famous examples of friction between militia and regular officers was actually in the Niagara region. Um, in Michigan, they tended to actually get along pretty well. There weren't too many um, spats between people who thought like, you know, they ought to be in charge because they're a regular or something like that. Almost all of the, the high ranking men in the, in the whole campaign were militia. Uh, there were a couple, I think there was a colonel um, and a couple of majors in the regular army, but uh, Hull was in overall command and the, there wasn't actually too much leadership friction. In Niagara, on the other hand, there was quite a lot. Uh, and a lot of that actually stemmed from the fact that uh, Stephen Van Rensselaer, who is the general in charge of all of the American operations in that theater, um, was himself a militia officer. And so when he was uh, supposed to coordinate with regular army officers, including General Alexander Smith, Smith being a West Point trained man, um, was really reluctant to take uh, Van Rensselaer's orders as anything other than suggestions. Uh, because he figured that it doesn't matter if you're the presidentially appointed general officer, um, you are, it's, you know, subservient to me because I'm a regular officer. Some of this also stemmed from uh, politics. Uh, ben Rensselaer was a known Federalist. He was a New York Federalist, and he was appointed specifically uh, in some capacity to sort of give the illusion that this was a unified effort, that both major political parties in the United States were working toward the same goal. And so Van Rensselaer had not a lot of military experience. His younger cousin did, Col uh, Solomon Van Rensselaer, had actually been an officer in Anthony Wayne's Legion. And there is quite a lot of talk about uh, Solomon Van Rensselaer, the younger one, being a little bit more uh, of the military genius uh, or lack thereof, I guess, uh, of the Niagara region. But Smith and Van Rensselaer did not get along. Um, there was also Peter B. Porter, who was the uh, sort of militia adjutant general and the uh, quartermaster who actually fought a duel with a regular officer uh, in September of 1812. Uh, nobody got hurt or anything. It just sort of quietly went off into the woods somewhere and shot at each other and then came back and everything was all fine. Um, but there was absolutely friction between the militia and the regulars, definitely. Um, Brent uh, Borshani asks, were battles in Brownstown linear or more skirmish-like uh, with people running all around? So um, the, the first one with Van Horn um, was an ambush. Uh, and it was, as far as, as all of any of the participants wrote about, it was pretty chaotic. Um, so it seemed like there were, uh, basically Tecumseh was present at both of these. Tecumseh was, was like the mastermind of this ambush at Van Horn. Um, so it was basically like, the description is like, you know, Indians popping out of the bush and firing rifles at them and no one really having any, any idea kind of how to deal with this. So they just sort of precipitously uh, retreated. Um, Brownstown was much more linear. Um, there was a, a moment for at least one journalist actually writes, um, or chronicler, I suppose, not necessarily a journalist, uh, wrote that there was a, an American force that actually like stood under fire for 90 minutes under British like regular volley fire. So they don't say whether or not they were like lying on the ground or taking cover, but I assume that they were. They're not that they were just like standing there, you know, <laughs> and just suffering each of these volleys to come around. But uh, the battle itself was very linear, right? Um, there are descriptions from um, participants on both sides sort of talk about the maneuvering and sort of positioning of troops. And they all uniformly agree that it ended with, you, you know, a, an organized volley and a bayonet charge on the part of the Americans. Um, so a little of both. Um, skirmishing was super important, but um, sort of the linear tactics were, were absolutely um, used on both sides uh, of that. Uh, so Dan Wilkins asks, uh, Van Horn later served in the regular army in 1813 and 14, like a lot of Ohio militia officers. And yeah, it's good to point out too, because um, the, the longer the war went on, the more they needed men in the regular army. And the way you kind of naturally did that was by trying to get people from the militia to come in and join. Um, so that was actually not uncommon. Um, and uh, Robert Lucas actually had, uh, when he joined, um, he was... He was actually offered um, the position of general of the Ohio militia, and he refused it because he wanted to actually serve as an enlisted man. He wanted to basically kind of um, motivate his fellow statesmen by kind of taking the lowest position that he possibly could in order to encourage more men to do so. 
Um, and so that kind of idea was, was, was at play quite a lot um, among men of the Northwest militia, for sure. Uh, and Robert Ryan actually says he's a reenactor for the War of 1812 with a Maryland unit, and they use the Smith Manual of Arms. And that wasn't uncommon. And again, there were there were quite a few of these to, to go from, and some of them actually even used French um, officers, so I or French uh, manuals. So I actually wouldn't be surprised if, when Hull first arrived, you know, these sort of francophone men in the Detroit militia were probably using like a French uh, manual, which they were actually growing in popularity. And Smith's manual, as, as I recall, is more or less an English translation of a French manual. It might be somebody else's, but I know that um, that became very popular around the early 19th century. So Jeff Pavlik asks, hey, Jeff, how's it going? Uh, what are the differences in form and function between the Canadian and the American militia? So the a lot of it was sort of strategic and logistical, uh, I guess is the way to put it. Um, the, the Canadian militia, uh, the British, the, the way the British used militia um, in the War of 1812 was a lot less about making them kind of the bulwark of the fighting. And it was a lot more about putting them in position to reinforce supply lines and dig entrenchments and kind of serve as sort of this uh, service capacity to the regulars who were expected to do most of the fighting. Whereas the Americans, it was sort of opposite is that they all kind of relied on, hopefully the supplies get there when they get there, but everybody's expected to do fighting uh, in sort of equal measure. Um, so. The, uh, the attack at Queenston Heights in October of 1812, um, the plan was 600 men were supposed to go across the river all at once. Uh, 300 of them were regulars and 300 of them were militia. Um, the regulars actually got swept downstream like their boats went off missing somewhere else and only the militia ended up landing. So they were the ones that actually did the bulk of the fighting for the first couple of hours of that battle. But um, it kind of goes to show the, the, the difference in sort of approach. Um, this of course, is sort of made possible because uh, the Canadians also have the extra advantage of very enthusiastic and very experienced um, Native American uh, sort of detachments that did the bulk that were happy to go out and do the fighting. Uh, they really wanted to. Um, and one of the issues after Isaac Brock was killed, uh, the British commander that took, or took over um, was not well liked by his Native allies and they, uh, his name was Proctor. Um, and they actually like mocked him pretty savagely uh, throughout most of his, his tenure as uh, overall commander in chief, precisely because he was unwilling to engage Americans in fights that the natives thought he should take. Um, and so that, that kind of makes a big difference. I'm sure if Americans had uh, more of a reliable kind of native alliance, they might've used their militia a little bit differently, but they just didn't. So uh, Jeff says some strategic problems just don't have operational solutions. And yeah, I agree. Um, there's just very little I think anybody could have done uh, in the position that Hull was in at the beginning of the war. Uh, so Craig asks, how were the questions about legality of sending the militia overseas resolved? They just weren't really. <laughs> um, one of the ways that they sort of, uh, that Americans ended up dealing with this problem, because it was a known problem. It was something that uh, that the planning stages of any, any war um, in the United States Kind of had to deal with. Um, what they did was they just tried to expand the size of the regular army by taking in more volunteers. So getting as many volunteers from the militia to join the regulars so that they could be kind of lashed to this again military hierarchy before the war starts. Um, so if you look at like the Mexican-American war, the number of militia that are involved are much, much, much smaller. Um, and the ones that are engaged are usually Texans and, and they're fighting because that's where they live. Um, and that's where they're kind of local. Whereas any of the men that kind of came from the East Coast or from uh, sort of the Southern states or even from the Northwest had come through this volunteer enlistment and then they were put into a regular regiment and then they were sent to fight that way. So legally, it never really was resolved. Um, eventually by like the, the 1890s, the sort of legal language around it changed when they instituted like the National Guard, but they still talk about issuing arms to the militia and in, even into the 1930s. Um, so like the militia and the National Guard being this kind of weird sort of legal separation framework is actually really complicated, but this central question pretty much never gets legally resolved. Um, it's just something that's kind of worked around by the way that they kind of conduct their operations. Uh, Robert Ryan asks, what was the most model musket used during the whole campaign? Uh, it depends. So 
probably uh, all the regulars would have had the 1795 Springfield, or they would have had a slightly updated model uh, that I believe there was one that came out like 1810, and there's also an 1815 model. Um, but they most likely would have been using something like a Springfield. Um, some of the militias may still have had uh, like shortland pattern or India pattern uh, muskets, because some militia regiments actually purchased their own muskets from overseas manufacturers and whatnot. So that really depended. Um, I think the bulk of them probably would have had 1795s. Um, the Springfield Arsenal had been up for long enough and had been producing muskets for long enough that they, you know, made actually quite a lot of money selling their stock to militias. Uh, that was a way that they kind of helped to uh, convince the American the Congress that it was worth investing in, a, in an arms manufactory to do. So Porter Hanks asks, can you talk a little bit about public perception of the regular army and militia pre-1812? Was it changed by the war? So I think that our public consciousness of the army and the militia uh, has switched basically like 180 degrees from the way that it was looked at in the early 19th century because the militia in the early 19th century was you and your neighbor and it was you know the fire chief and it was the librarian and it was like all of these, these people who are kind of community pillars um, who are doing community service, as well as if they need to, taking up arms to defend the country. Whereas a soldier was somebody who was not skilled enough or smart enough to have able employment and to kind of have an interest in any local community. They were generally viewed as transient. They were viewed as moral hazards. They were viewed as people who were untrustworthy. They were viewed as people who were unintelligent. Um, and generally, being in the army was not a thing you wanted to be at any point. Um, and so that kind of perception has, has total, almost totally flipped in American culture today is where we look at soldiers as kind of like patriotic men doing service for, for the country, whereas it was almost the re reverse in the early 19th century. Um, and a lot of this has to do with sort of uh, enlightenment ideas uh, about state organization that the United States founded itself on um, that essentially looked at an army, especially as essentially a one-stop shop to tyranny. Um, the moment you have a standing army, it's going to be misused, it's going to be used for violence against its own people, and it's going to be uh, turned into a tool of tyranny. Um, and that's the way that most people looked at an army. And so reliance on the militia was simultaneously like a concession to public consciousness, uh, as well as it was a, a necessary um, attitude of, of the American sort of war fighting culture, because these were the men that need to be doing the fighting because you don't have an endless supply of poor transient men who are going to be willing to join the army to do so. Um, so generally, I would say just to make it short, the militia were the, were like the, the kind of stand up guys that you're going to like salute and thank for their service. Whereas the soldiers are the people you want to get away from you. Just like go stand over there. Like, thank you for your service, but please go away. Uh, is kind of the way that they looked at it in, in the early 19th century. Um, and Brent asks if you can ask a question over voice in just a couple of minutes. So we've only got uh, two more questions that have already been kind of sent up here. So Kyle asks, was there militia from the Indiana Territory that were involved in the Detroit campaign? Um, they There were, but not in, in a great many numbers. So the Indiana uh, man actually came up in the French town, uh, the, sort of the second that they, they attempt to recapture Detroit uh, a few months later. The idea behind uh, mostly cultivating men from Ohio was to actually get all the men who were there and mustered and ready to go up there and invaded soon. And sort of the second wave was going to come up. And these were going to be uh, Kentucky and Indiana men uh, that participated. But in that first kind of whole campaign, um, there's almost no mention of people from Indiana like at all. I know they're right there. They're right next door. Uh, but they really weren't involved in any great numbers uh, at all. Uh, and then Willis asked, uh, how did Hull balance the responsibility of being territorial governor and military commander at the same time? Uh, that is, he was not only responsible for the military, but also the civilian population. And that's that's true. And that's very perceptive. Um, and as a territorial governor, he was also the military governor. And this was kind of the way that the territorial governor governorship worked. So it's the same with William Henry Harrison, who is the governor of Indiana. He was essentially the commander in chief of the Indiana militia, as well as being the governor. Um, and it was the same was true to Hull. So the way that he balanced this was by essentially constantly balancing all of his actions and the success of the war and his place in politics and his personal ambition against the safety of the people in uh, his community. And ultimately his decision to uh, surrender Fort Detroit 
had to do with the idea of saving lives. Uh, he didn't want the British to have to assault the fort. He didn't want all of the people in the fort to get killed because he thought that like, like many men did in the early 19th century, that if natives are forced to attack a, sort of an entrenched fort of any size, that they might take out their anger and um, the losses that they suffered in doing so on the civilian population, which is what happened only a couple of months later at Frenchtown. Um, and it is what happened throughout the war in various places. This was one of the reasons that Porter Hanks actually de decided to surrender Fort Mackinac was to prevent what they called the effusion of blood uh, that must result from an attack like that. So his sort of perspective on things, again, we can't just say is purely military. We like to think that because he's General William Hull, but he's also the governor of the territory. And he also has to look out for things like saving people's lives and safeguarding the civilians. And he realized that if he surrendered Fort, uh, Fort Detroit, there was probably not going to be any rough handling of the civilians because the British would keep control of this. And the British aims were purely military uh, and they weren't going, they weren't like looking to come and slaughter American citizens or anything like that. So his decision ultimately of surrendering the fort, I think, is kind of the fusion of his, of his job as military commander and also sort of the governor, right, the safeguard of the territory uh, and somebody who's supposed to look out for their interests as well. Uh, and so that is the, that's the last question that we have on uh, the chat here. So I think a couple of you asked if you want to ask questions over voice, and I'm happy to remain here for the next few minutes at least. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I wanted to ask you, um, I uh, have been reading the, uh, the book by uh, Donald Hickey on the yeah. War of 1812. And in the beginning of it, he talks about how um, John Adams is trying to build up sort of the army and the navy. But once Thomas Jefferson comes in office, they sort of the Democrat Republicans put a stop to that. Yeah. And so my question to you is um, just kind of as kind of a historical what if, but had the programs under John Adams went further and got more men into the army itself? Would the uh, so instead of having just ten thousand regulars, there would have been you know mm -hmm. I don't know how many other how many more yeah. there would be. But if if there was more regulars, do you think the invasion of Canada would have gone a little bit differently, or would have been about the same? Because you talked about with the militia, some of them didn't go because of legalities and stuff like that. So would those issues be avoided had there been more regulars? That's a good question. And I, I don't know how far afield I want to go with it, right? Because it's it's counterfactual. But um, I don't know. It's it's interesting because the, the thing is about like, so Adams was a Federalist um, and he wanted to have some sort of a strong core to, to the American state. Um, and that included having an army and a navy. He, however, wanted it to be pretty small and just really well organized. Whereas somebody like um, uh, Alexander Hamilton this is something that, that you don't really see his this side of his character in the musical, unfortunately, but he uh, had sort of, say, delusions of grandeur. He really wanted to be a military leader. And he had been at the beginning, uh, all through the, the Revolutionary War. And when he kind of uh, came to the sort of highest levels of office, um, he was always really pushing to have like this really aggressive and large military. He wanted to have something kind of like the French did. He wanted to have something really big and really impressive with really big hats, with big tall crests and everything on them. Um, this was never, ever popular. Um, and Adams, Adams's plan was actually fairly modest. And I don't know that it would have survived even one, uh, you know, uh, one uh, tenure of Thomas Jefferson because Jefferson really didn't want to spend any money on a military at all. Um, he sort of ultimately was persuaded to come and, and spend a bit more on it for various reasons. And the, the Federalist and the Democratic Republican positions kind of switched as soon as Jefferson and Madison were in power because they realized like, well, we're going to need to fight a war and we can't do it without a military. So like, let's get more men. But by then the Federalists are the ones that are actually voting against increasing the size of the army. So I don't know that I would say that if John Adams had been able to kind of pass some of these reforms like they wanted to, and a lot of these actually included things um, like suggestions by like Henry Knox, who is the secretary of war under uh, Washington and Adams to institute nationally a much more organized and much more um, sort of legally restricted militia, 
Uh, this was something that would look a lot more like the modern National Guard rather than something like the sort of disorganized kind of cultural ad hoc militia. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think ultimately the problems, especially in Detroit, were logistical more than they were uh, related to manpower. Um, the Americans constantly outnumbered the, the Canadians throughout like the entire duration of the conflict. But the problem was like, you need to feed those guys and you need to make sure they have food and tents and medicine. And if you don't have any of that and you don't have any hope of getting more of that, it's really difficult to do anything, even if you can, you know, whip your men until they move. Um, so uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's an interesting, it's an interesting thought experiment, I think. Um, and sort of the, the what if, you know, Jefferson hadn't kind of swept power in 1800 the way that he did. Um, what the kind of the, the institution of the American military would have looked like around 1812. It's, I'm not sure. It's pretty unclear. I know it's kind of a non-answer, but <laughs> um, and Robert Ryan asks, I kind of wonder if Hull was treated fairly at his court-martial by General Dearborn, despite the evidence Hull presented. So his court-martial is um, interesting in its own right. Um, there's a, uh, a writer named Nicole Eustace who wrote a, a book called 1812, Patriotism or Passions and patriotism or something like that. Um, Nicole Eustace is her name. I'll actually put it in the chat because it's kind of a goofy name and hard to spell. Um, I think it's called War and the Passions of Patriotism or something like that. Uh, she actually writes a, a whole big chunk of her book um, to Hull's trial. And she actually talks quite a lot about how um, his trial ultimately is more or less doomed from the start. Like nobody is on Hull's side. Um, the way that the war ended, uh, which was with this kind of triumphant fanfare, even though realistically that isn't at all how the war ended, um, sort of predisposed the American public to thinking that Hull was a traitor already. And so like she talks about how this was essentially just a show and this was staged deliberately at every level of it. And Hull could have come in with, you know, captured British officers who said, you know, he was the bravest man alive and he stormed them with his small sword and slew 14 of them, you know, with a straight face. And he probably still would have been Con convicted of treason because the entire the uh, entire idea was to sort of give some catharsis about the war by saying yeah you're guilty of being a coward but i madison the president forgive you um it's actually a really really fascinating um sort of portrait of of the war and i would recommend if anybody's interested especially in kind of the more cultural aspects of the war of 1812 um to check out nicole eustace's book uh, it's really 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 good um, and I, I honestly think it's probably the most interesting book about the War of 1812 that I've read, um, which is saying quite a lot. Okay, any other questions? Last question from Brent. Uh, any good sources on the black militias in the War of 1812? So I'll put this in the chat too. Um, you wanna look for Taya Miles, or Tia Miles, um, who wrote The Dawn of Detroit. Uh, and that so far um, is the only, the only book that deals with any kind of depth uh, about Peter Dennison and the black militia in Detroit. Um, it doesn't really talk about anywhere else. Uh, the book is about Detroit. Um, so that's kind of, you know, you got to take that when you can, but uh, uh, it's really good. It's very interesting. Uh, and as far as I know, the only other books are that are written about um, sort of the black experience during the war um, is uh, the name of the book is uh, the internal enemy. Uh, is the other one. I can't remember the name of the author, but The Internal Enemy deals mostly with uh, the British and their attempts to um, create uh, sort of these black regiments of captured American slaves as an aspect of economic warfare against the American South. Um, so that deals predominantly with the South and it deals predominantly with um, sort of the British perspective on things, uh, but it, it does kind of illuminate quite a lot of the, the sort of um, the culture of the slavery at the time and sort of the ideas of what black men were good for uh, from, from the very white colonial perspective. Um, it, that one's pretty good. Alan Taylor is the name of the, of the writer. Alan Taylor, uh, The Internal Enemy is the only other one I'd recommend. So that, and that's again, another one of these kind of big uh, missing pieces in the historiography. So if that's something that interests you, I would definitely recommend um, trying to pick up uh, Tia Miles and then pursuing that as far as it goes. I know for a fact that the Detroit um, archives are very, very, very willing to work with researchers and they're really happy to have the chance to do so. The few times I've visited, they've been exceptionally helpful. So uh, Robert asked, is BJ Lossing's Pictorial Field Book of the War of 1812 a good read? Uh, I am not familiar with that one. 
so I don't know. I think the the book I'd recommend as a starting point is John Latimer's um, 1812, The War with America. It's written by an Englishman. Um, and he actually like died very recently after publishing it. But that, that I think is the most concise and the simultaneously most comprehensive sort of intro um, to there. But if you're really interested in this, you have to read Latimer, you have to read Don Hickey's um, 1812, uh, the, the, A Forgotten Conflict uh, and the various other ones. Like fortunately, the historiography is so thin that all of the secondary works you could read in like a weekend. There's maybe 10 or 12 of them and that's it. <laughs> um, so you can uh, you can kind of take your pick on, on some of those. So it looks like we're getting some uh, thank yous to you, Adam. Yeah. Um, so it's probably time to wrap things up before your head gets too big. Uh, thank you very much for coming <laughs> out today. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, everyone that came out online, hopefully you enjoyed this talk with Adam. We do have some more virtual lectures coming up after the new year. We're taking a break uh, for December. January, we're waiting for a firm commitment from our speaker, but I can tell you that February, we're gonna have a representative from Pershing Zone, uh, the current US Army band, and our very own John Thompson uh, to compare and contrast roles of musicians in the regular army in 1812 and today's uh, military. We also do have some other digital content. If you check out our website, which is fortmigs.org, uh, we have a regular podcast series and we've been participating in uh, Guns Across the Lakes with many other War of 1812 sites in our neighborhood. And I saw Craig Wilson on here earlier. So we know Mackinac Parks is represented in that as well. So thank you all for coming out tonight. Hopefully you enjoyed this and hopefully we hear from you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody. Thank you, Kelly.